Final President of the Petaluma Museum. Welcome to Beyond the Exhibition. Very exciting for Petaluma. A uh, very exciting speaker today uh, from NASA Ames. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Morley. Well, thanks everybody for, for coming out. And um, I haven't given this particular flavor of, a, of my uh, public affairs talk, so it's the first time I've given it. But feel free to interrupt me whenever you like to ask lots of questions. Um, that's a nice, uh, intimate setting here, so let's take advantage of it. I was thinking today, just looking, walking around the exhibit, looking at the beautiful pictures, is I grew up in the era of Apollo and, and the Viking missions to Mars and the Pioneer and Voyager and the Voyager missions to the outer solar system. And I think the thing that was so evocative about that is you would go from not knowing anything about, say, a planet, it's not about Saturn, and then the first spacecraft goes by and you have all of these close-up images of an entire new world, and your knowledge is leaped by factors of hundreds and thousands. And that idea that we were exploring these new worlds really was appealing to me. And so later, I ultimately grew up and went into uh, science, and I wanted to study planetary science, understanding the planets in our solar system. And now, in the last 15 years or so, we've entered an era of studying planets around other stars. And that's something, again, these whole new worlds we're learning about. I just got back last week, I was in Flagstaff at a scientific meeting about planets around other stars. And it was just so exciting to, again, here's new worlds that are discovered, and over the course of a year or two, we learned so much about them. So what I thought I'd try to do today in the talk is maybe the first half talk a little bit about some solar system science, showing some beautiful images from the solar system and then tell you a little bit about the search for other worlds, the search for planets around other stars, um, the Kepler mission, which is trying to find out if there's, how common our own Earth is in the universe. So that's the plan. And like I said, feel free to, uh, you know, if you have any questions. I like this image of Earth to start with. It was taken by the Galileo spacecraft when it flew by Earth on its way to Jupiter. And what do you know? What's, what's different about this particular view of Earth? Yeah, yeah, where's the continents? And so this is from the, the South Pacific, and you just can't, uh, Australia is just peeking out over here, but it really gives you a feeling of us being a water world of just oceans and sky and clouds. Um, and people wonder when we think about planets around other stars, are there worlds like this that don't have continents? Do you need life? Does life require land to get started or to be there? Of course, one particular planet that people have spent a lot of time thinking about is Mars. And Mars has been in our imagination, human imagination, for a long time. And uh, in, uh, when I was in Flagstaff, we saw this telescope. This is Percival Lowell, who uh, a lot of time studying Mars. This is kind of the classic, kind of far side comic astronomer, you know, peering through the long uh, telescope. And they had on exhibit some of his books and sketches of Mars. And here's Mars in the sky. Uh, and you look at his sketches and he's drawing these canals, looking something like this. This is actually another contemporary Chaparelli uh, drawing his what he thought Mars looked like. And an, an Italian, uh, these cano, these canals, don't imply necessarily that someone made them. It's sort of the equivalent of a channel. But by the time canal got into the uh, English translation, it carries this evocative idea of someone made the canals. And this was part of the reason that people really started thinking about life and, uh, and humans on Mars, or not humans, but life on Mars. Interestingly, from the same time period as Chaparelli, Antoniotti was also drawing, and he uh, observing Mars, and he was more of a, had an artistic background, and was a little bit better at drawing what he actually saw. And if you actually look through a telescope, this is a better representation of what you're seeing on Mars, with what we know now are impact craters and, and dark areas, you see, you lose those linear lines that other people were drawing and calling canals. Here's a map of Mars from 1877. 
and you can see lots of these channels maybe bringing, the imagination was you're bringing water from the poles to the mm -hmm. warmer equator. And back again to the disk. So there's a nice view of Mars, this giant equatorial canyon. This is Valles Marineris. It stretches east to west about the length of the United States. And there's giant uh, volcano, as you can see, here on the limb. So the first missions to Mars started in the 1960s with the Mariner missions. And the very first images returned by these spacecraft that just at first just flew by Mars were of a dry, barren, desolate desert. Craters looked a lot like the moon, and this really forever ended this idea of channels and, and canals and, and, a, and a temperate Mars. But then, we sent spacecraft into orbit around the planet, and as we look kind of the theme we find is you first fly by, and then you visit again, maybe you go into orbit, you send better cameras, better technology. This is, you know, 1960s technology, returning these, these images from Mars. But now, we have images of, of channels and valleys. And it turned out that the very first images from Mariner were of particularly dry and desolate areas. But it turned out there really were channels. And it looks this kind of leaf-like dendritic pattern. Looks for all the world which you might see in the, in the desert southwest, looking at um, uh, erosion on, a, on the side of a, of a desert mountain, perhaps caused by rainfall. And so this again changed the, uh, changed the conception of what we might uh, think of, how we might be thinking about Mars. And Viking also, this is not a Viking image, but a later image, found these very huge, what are called outflow channels, that are miles, a mile or two across, hundreds of meters deep. And these were formed by the catastrophic release of vast quantities of water, perhaps from reasons that people still don't understand. It was released suddenly from the subsurface and raced across the, raced across the surface of Mars. So we know today, if you take water to the surface and uh, pour your milk jug full of water on the surface, because the atmospheric pressure is only about six tenths of a percent of the surface pressure on Earth, the water starts to immediately boil away, and then as it boils, it loses its heat and it will ultimately freeze. So, water, liquid water, is not stable on the surface of Mars today. So, understanding how fluvial features like the channels, the valleys formed in the past is, remains one of the biggest mysteries in understanding Mars. Was there once a warm, temperate climate, or was it different, and how long was that? These are deep. These are, um, you know, I don't know, just off the top of my head, but these are like hundreds of meters deep. And so these may have been formed, this, these outflow channels, by one or two catastrophic events. In the Pacific Northwest, in the eastern Washington, there's huge similar channels that uh, uh, were formed by a, a glacial dam breaking. So water would build up behind the dam, you had a huge lake called Lake Missoula, and then eventually the the ice dam would break, um, and it released huge, huge amounts of water. And you see these same kind of, many of the same similar features. And it took a long time for people to appreciate it, because they were on the ground, and on a human scale, you don't recognize it. But when you look at aerial photos or photos from space, you can start to appreciate the scale of what you're looking at. And again, looking closer, uh, in about uh, the late 90s, uh, we said there was a long pause from 1970s, late 1970s, all the way to the late 1990s when we did not have any spacecraft at Mars. But finally, in the late 90s, we said more modern technology, sharper cameras that looked again, and they found that not only were there these big valleys and these channel features, but there was very tiny what were called gullies in many places on the planet. And you can see these gullies incising down. You're looking at a crater. You're looking at an impact crater. And this is on the wall of the crater where you see all the uh, erosion carrying fluids down to, the, down, to this, down to the bottom of the crater. So how is it that I just told you 
that liquid water is not stable on Mars today, and it's not. But yet, we have these very fresh, crisp appearing features. The ancient gullies, the ancient channel I showed, were formed millions of billions of years ago. But how could these things be formed? Maybe in the last years or 10,000 years. Ago. That was my question when you said fresh. How, how, how What does fresh mean? And that's, so uh, you know, when you look at a uh, planetary surface, the way you tell how old it is, is if you look at how many impact craters there are. I used to tell my students that if you had two cars parked under a tree that was full of birds, and one car was clean and fresh, and others had, the other one had tons of bird droppings on it, you knew which car had been sitting under the tree longer. And so the same thing in the solar system, we're constantly being bombarded by asteroids and comets. And so surfaces that don't have many craters on it are young and fresh, and highly cratered surfaces are much older. But here, you don't see any fresh impact craters. The features are very sharp, but we don't know. Is it 10 years or 1,000 years? And one of the things that the camera that's currently orbiting around Mars today is looking for is trying to find changes in these where we know that they've been caused by current activity. And this is just some more pretty pictures of, the, of these gully features. This one's kind of hard to tell. Sometimes it, it, it's uh, hard to tell which way is which way is up. In fact, this is up and this is down, and these are gullies cutting in. Although, if you look at it here, they look for me when I look at it, it looks like it's popping up. It's really not. Side so up, side so down. Uh, <laughs> that helps. It's never. Yeah. It's never thought to be lava flows. So that's a good question. So early on, early on. Uh, especially from the look like the Viking orbiters, when people started seeing these features, there was a debate, are we looking at lava flows? Are we looking at something that's caused by running water? Or people even started to imagine very exotic things like uh, liquid hydrocarbons or uh, weird gases that might be, be, be causing these. And in, and in fact, these features are all caused by water. It's the most, it's the most abundant. It's the most abundant thing. It's the, it's the most natural explanation. There are lava flows, and you have to be careful because sometimes lava can can do things like that. But these are definitely not lava. So here's more gullies. Again, another in, another crater. You can see the gully is starting up here. It's running down, depositing a, a fan down here. And so we know it looks like pretty much in the in the near present time we still have liquid water. And that is one of the reasons, again, people keep bringing, coming back to this idea, is, is there life on Mars? Can we find life on Mars? And the Viking landers that landed in the 1970s had experiments that looked for signs of life. And they came up empty-handed. And pretty much ever since, there's no evidence. People will keep thinking, well, maybe we can find microbial life or, or fossils of ancient life. And it's just this idea is so implanted that it keeps coming back again and again. But for now, there's no, there's no good evidence. In fact, there's a current controversy that some people have claimed they see traces of methane gas in the atmosphere. And it'd be very hard to understand where this methane might be coming from. On Earth, it comes from, from animals and, uh, and uh, termites and you know, belching cows. But obviously, we don't have that on Mars. And so it's like, well, maybe this is a, a signature of life. Uh, but. There's still a lot of controversy. It's not even clear if the methane's really there. But that gives you an idea when we get to the point of talking about life around other uh, planets around other stars. We want to know if they're inhabited. How would we figure that out? If we can't even decide if there's you know, life on Mars, uh, what are the things we might, we might look for? Can I answer a question? Yes, go ahead. If those are definitely from water. Yeah. Are you assuming that they're from rain? Or are they from, as you mentioned earlier, like up in, in, in the American Northwest, from some kind of natural um, uh, deluge from a dam, broken? Right. So the big ones, the big, huge valleys, had to have come from some kind of outpouring of water from you know, a dam or some kind of sudden subsurface release. The little ones, the little dendritic leaf-like, leaf vein -like, leaf like ones, some people think, uh, my wife actually studies Mars, and she's very much in the camp that these look like something caused perhaps by rainfall. But other people think that, well, maybe there's ways you could get subsurface water to come out and, and flow across the surface that way. Like a spring. Like a spring, exactly, a spring. So that's still, or maybe there was a snowpack 
and the snowpack melted on the bottom and it ran out from under the bottom. Well, there the, was an impact that created the spring that forced the water to the surface? Or, yeah, or like a nearby impact or something, that it, some kind of Mars quake that caused a, the water to come up. Or changing climate over hundreds of millions of years, Mars goes through very long cycles where it gets warmer and cooler, but still not warm enough to be obviously a home run that you can have liquid water. But maybe there's things we don't understand about the climate, or maybe the, the atmosphere was thicker in the past. So you have to start making, telling stories like that and testing to see if it makes sense. Yes? Why is it necessarily a precursor to life outside of our planet for there to be water? Well, the the prejudice that people have is, is that life requires, that water is a requirement for life. And that's based a lot on, of course, what we see here. Water is the, one of the most abundant molecules. It's really great for lots of, uh, uh, it's, good, it's good with chemistry and dissolving organic molecules and for a lot of good reasons. So people really like water as a solvent for life. Which is not to say that you couldn't have life without water, but it's just, you know, our one data point, right? It could so. be completely erroneous, yeah, and right. we may need it. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And we all, and people understand that. That's, but it's sort of, it's, uh, it's a good place to start. It's like looking you know, at the story of where, you know, the drunk that loses his keys, and he's looking under the light post because that's where the light is, but it's not necessarily where he lost his keys. So. And, and then, of course, at this, this theme of looking closer and looking in more detail, we've sent a number of rovers to Mars. Right now, JPL is building this almost SUV-sized rover that's uh, going to launch, I think it's later this year, and it's going to be driving over the surface and doing a lot of great, uh, interesting science. Right now, there's, uh, there's two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. One of them is pretty much dead. It's apparently dead. But the other one is still, even today, roving across the surface. Wow. And those robot, those rovers were designed to function for what, 90 days? 90 days. Yeah, the warranty was 90 days, and it's been, I don't even know now, years. Around eight years. Eight years, yeah. So this is, um, uh, I think even, even the one, it's, it's the, 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 they thought that the, actually the induction motors and the wheels were going to get dust in them and chew themselves up. Uh, but they did. And... Um, this is the landing site for Opportunity. This is the one that's still alive. And it landed on an airbag. You can see here the remains of the airbag bounced around and then uh, drove off. Huh. It's kind of cool to see the tire tracks. The rumor has it that the next rover, the tire tracks, they have uh, JPL in size into the tires. So as you're going to see JPL. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually true, yes? Does Mars have seasons, and night and day, and a year? Right, so the day on Mars is 24 hours and change. Uh, 40, 40 minutes. 40 minutes, something like that. So it spends once, you have night and day, 20, you know, a little over a day. Uh -huh. And then it has a, it, Mars has seasons. Mars has a much, you know, they're, they're one of the misconceptions, that's, you know, especially if you're teaching um, undergraduates or, or grade school kids, if they think the seasons on Earth are caused by the elliptical orbit of the Earth. So that if you're warmer when you're closer to the sun and you're cooler when you're far away. In fact, the Earth has almost a perfectly circular orbit and the seasons are caused by the tilt of the axis. Uh, so Mars does have a tilt, but it also ha does in fact have an egg-shaped orbit. So it has more extreme seasons. So when you're uh, farther away and tilted away, it's really cold. And the opposite season with that hemisphere, if you're closer to the sun and tilted mm -hmm. towards it. So Mars has four seasons. They're just not symmetrical like, like our own seasons are. And how long is a year? Uh, uh, what is a Mars year? Two years? Uh, about two or three two years. Two years, yeah. Uh, and I'm not positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that in the northern hemisphere, the Earth is actually closest to the sun during winter. That's right. That's true. The Earth is really closest to the sun during, the, during our own winter. Um, I think there's a famous video for teaching astronomy where they show Harvard's graduates on graduation day, and they're interviewing them why are their seasons, and about 90% of them do not correctly explain <laughs> why their seasons. So this is a motivation for it's important to teach the season. Um, so here we are. We're on Mars. So it's um, uh, and so in this theme I had the theme of looking looking closer and closer. The the, the rover which 
this kind of self-portrait so you don't see it, but this is a, a robotic arm that has a camera on it, a microscope. And if you look in detail, wow. you can see like this is a little about the size of a blueberry. Uh, it's a little uh, mineral that's formed in water. So when you go up close, not only do you see the big evidence for water, but you look up close and you see more evidence for sort of that this soil was saturated in water at one time. This is just another photo I like of the, uh, what's called the back shell. Or this is actually, this is the heat shield that was protecting the, the spacecraft as it was entering the atmosphere. And then they throw it away in light of parachute. And you can see where the, the heat shield crashed into the surface. And it actually turned inside out uh, when it hit. So you're looking at the inside of what was once a cone. And um, this is just, again, more stratigraphy. And um, looking at layers that were probably laid down on the shores of a sea at one time. But this could have been billions of years ago. And the rover has since it left its landing site, it's driven all the way to the, uh, this um, uh, impact crater. And this is a Photoshop rover stuck on This is the picture was taken by the rover, but it shows, just to give you an idea of the scale of uh, what it might look like on the, on the surface. And it's on its way to an even bigger crater called Endurance Crater. That it's still like another year away, but it's, it's lived so long that uh, a, it has a good chance of getting to the bigger crater. Craters are nice because it gives you sort of, somebody's dug a hole for you into yeah. the surface, and you can see the stratigraphy and the rocks and the layers that are underneath, underneath the ground. And this is a, uh, uh, I think this picture is actually in the gallery. Is a, I really like is a sunset image taken from Mars. And the rover, uh, this is from the other rover, uh, Spirit, which climbed a hill. And so it's up, there's lots of interesting, you can see there's almost like mountain ranges in the distance, our setting sun. And it's just very evocative, of making this surface of Mars seem like a very real place. Can you see uh, Earth from Mars? Funny you ask. <laughs> So here we are, same kind of sunset view. Now we're looking at an evening star from Mars, and right here is uh, is Earth. I'm going to show you several more pictures of Earth from uh, as we get progressively farther away. So here we are, and back to back to Earth. So that's my little tour of tour of Mars. Now I'll just show you a few other slides, just kind of comment on things that you might see in the gallery, and then I'll talk about finding Earths around around other worlds a little bit. Of course, beyond the orbit of Mars, we have the asteroid belt. Um, Twenty years ago, we didn't we had zero images of what asteroids looked like but between various spacecraft. We now have, I think, about a dozen different a asteroids have been visited by, by spacecraft. This top left is, the, is Ceres, which is actually big enough that it's round. And this whole debate of you know, what is a planet, you have to be careful because uh, uh, you have asteroids that look like little worlds. And in smaller asteroids, gravity is not strong enough to pull them into a, into a spherical shape. So there's this... There's this uh, battle between gravity and strength. And at small scales, strength wins, it's like, just like it does in a rock, and at big scales, gravity wins. And so if you start saying, well, planets have to be round, then that's why you, know, you have to start maybe including Ceres. And Ceres was actually counted as a planet for, I think, 10 or 20 years in the 1800s after it was found. People included it uh, as a planet. And they decided it was too small. Sort of the same thing that happened with Pluto. And then beyond the asteroid belt, are the giant planets, um, which are sort of my specialty. I like to say that uh, my wife and I have divided up the solar system. She gets the rocky planets, and I get the gas ones. That way we don't argue. Um, <laughs> but this is this is Jupiter. This is the great red spot. I put it on its side just so it better fit on the slide. But uh, Earth would be about the size of the great of the great red spot. These are all belts and zones of, of what you're seeing are clouds of ammonia. 
that have been polluted by smog, photochemical smog, just like Los Angeles smog. It rains down, there's, uh, there's also uh, methane in Jupiter's atmosphere, which is, interacts with ultraviolet light and makes this sticky kind of tarry stuff that rains down and sticks to the ammonia clouds, which gives Jupiter its color. And Galileo himself saw the great red slot. So we know that this storm has been there for 300 years or more, uh, uh, spinning around in Jupiter's atmosphere. How do you know that? How do you know this stuff is like ammonia? And you can't go out there and test that. Well, so you look. So what you do is you look at Jupiter in your telescope, and you take a spectrum of it, which spreads out the light in all the different wavelengths. And different molecules absorb different light at different wavelengths. And so, for example, ammonia at certain wavelengths. You look at Jupiter; it's very dark. Why is it dark? Because the light, instead of bouncing off, is being absorbed by the ammonia gas in the atmosphere. And you look at the particular wavelengths where Jupiter's dark, and it's like a fingerprint to see, oh, that must be ammonia, or that must be methane. And that's how we find out what's in the atmosphere. And then, in fact, we have gone out there and tested it. We've dropped a, an atmospheric probe called the Galileo probe into the atmosphere. And it had a mass spectrometer to measure what the atmosphere was made out of and radio the information back. So uh, that's how we know. But we're finding now, you know, Jupiter's, you know, lots of Jupiter's around other stars, and finding these same compounds uh, in other Jupiters. So it's kind of, it's fun. There's a lot, there's a lot of interesting images. I didn't, I, uh, of, uh, of some of the moons of Jupiter so in this next room, of Io, the volcanic moon, and Europa covered with ice. I didn't include any of my, in my slide deck. But beyond Jupiter is Saturn. Saturn's less nasty than Jupiter, farther from the sun. It's a little bit cooler. The ammonia clouds are deeper, and so they're more muted. But of course, the thing that never ceases to amaze, and you've never seen Saturn in a small telescope, is the rings. It almost looks like that they were you know, painted onto the, onto the telescope. They're so hard to believe. But the rings are, are made of um, trillions of golf ball, soccer ball size, balls of ice, uh, all orbiting around, uh, orbiting around the planet. And even the origin of the Saturn's rings and exactly how old they are is also not well known. So many people argue about it. Just another pretty picture. You can see you know, the rings are not smooth. There's all these grooves and waves and subtleties in the rings that are caused by tugging the gravitational interactions between the rings and the moons. Uh, it looks almost like a photograph record. And you're seeing, here's the rings, and you can see the light, the, uh, uh, the uh, shadow of the rings. Here the sun is very low uh, at the time this particular picture was taken. Right almost edge on to the rings, the rings are very dark, and then you can see the shadow is very narrow on the planet. Excuse me. Yeah? Are these pictures taken by the Cassini mission? Yeah, I should have said. So uh, all the really good ones, like this one and this one <laughs> and these over here, were all taken by uh, Cassini. And Carolyn Porco, who is the uh, PI of the, of, the, of the lead of the camera, set out to not only take the science images that they wanted to take, but also they keep track of when there's interesting alignments between moons. Like there's some good, great examples here. And when, when, when can we just take a good picture? And they focus more than any other mission, I think, on just taking compelling images. And if you're taking 10,000 images, you know, it's okay to spend a couple of hundred just taking pretty pictures. <laughs> and uh, they've just done a great job. I think it's just so, it's just so compelling. Can you, can you uh, discuss what the Cassini uh is doing now, what is eventual? Sure, so Cassini is, I think, uh, the biggest, if not maybe one of the one or two biggest spacecraft ever sent to another planet. It's huge, I don't even think, I don't, it's, it's like barely like fits in here. School bus or something? It's big, I don't, uh, I just remember the first time I was hearing people talk about it, I just you couldn't believe it was going to be launched. Um, and so it's been there since, when did Cassini get there? 2000-ish to Saturn. 
Is that right? I'm not positive about that. So it's been there a while now. And its mission, its first mission was, you know, orbit, it delivered a probe that fell into Titan's atmosphere. Uh, we took images of the surface. And now it's been orbiting, orbiting, studying this planet, the rings, the moons. Titan is of great interest. It has seas of liquid ethane on the surface. Uh, it has a radar that probes through the thick clouds of Titan. And so it's, 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 it's got an extension and then it got another extension, and now the plan is to, um, I think they're going to go maybe six more years continuing to study long-term changes on Titan, the moons, and eventually uh, they're going to crash it. They're going to bring it in, uh, I think even in this gap inside the inner ring and Saturn for a couple of orbits, and they're going to drop it into, the, uh, into uh, Saturn. There's something called planetary protection, which is to not contaminate the universe with microbes that might have started on Earth. And so there's, they'd like to get rid of spacecraft, like the Galileo orbiter at Jupiter was ultimately dropped into Jupiter. And then they're going to do the same thing with Cassini. And so Cassini still has another five or six years before it runs out of fuel. And just another here's seasons on Saturn. This is taken from um, Hubble. Again, you can see the axial tilt changing. And this is an image I like. Uh, the red, it's a composite. The red is an infrared image where you're seeing the glow of heat leaking out of Saturn. And the, the other colors are visible light. So it's the, the light scattered from the atmosphere. And so it's just really compelling. Uh, it gives you an idea of just the dynamics and the excitement of what's going on in the atmosphere. And then this is uh, one of my favorite images of the uh, in the solar system. Again, taken by Cassini, but it was taken when the spacecraft was behind the planet looking back at the sun. And so this planet is dark. You're looking, if you know, if you ever drive like me, you don't wash your car, and then you drive towards the sunset, all of a sudden your windshield lights up with all the dust on your windshield because little dust grains scatter light in the forward direction really well. And so what you're seeing here is the rings are all nice and bright because they're scattering sunlight towards you. And even on the back, some of the light from the rings is coming around. You can see them here. You can see this dust, this gas ring here. And there's something else you can see that the lights are, are killing us. I, I can't even find it myself. Right? Oh, here it is. Right here is another you are here image. So you're looking back at the sun, back over here, and so off orbiting the sun is the Earth. And uh, you're using Saturn, like you're putting your thumb up to block out the sunlight so you can see the Earth. Is that gas ring part of the ring system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is produced by, we now know, produced by uh, uh, geysers and jets on Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn. It's leaking gas out, and it's making this, this ring. So uh, further out, Uranus and Neptune. Um, you know, there's a nice image. I think it's Neptune right there. Uh, these are planets intermediate between the gas giants and, and, the, and the rocky planets. Turns out these are very common. There's lots of Uranus and Neptunes in the galaxy. They're, they're not real exciting, but there's a lot of them. Here's a, here's a image of Neptune taken by Voyager, but it flew by in uh, 1990. And this is uh, uh, Neptune's moon Triton, which is about the size of our moon. Almost looks like a cantaloupe. Lots of different textures. You're looking at, here it's so cold, you're so far away from the sun that nitrogen gas, like makes up most of our own atmosphere, is frozen as an ice. So this is, uh, at these temperatures, water ice is like as hard as a rock. Nitrogen is an ice, but it flows a little bit, creeps around, and may be responsible for some of the geology you see. It's kind of like a green band across that image. Was that just enhanced color? Yeah, these things have been really stretched. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's just, uh, that's not quite really there. And then, as this is because one of Voyager's last parting shots of Neptune, just this, these white bands. Cloud bands, I kind of like it. It looks almost like something you see at see at Earth. 
And then further out is, this is from taken from the Space Telescope, this is Pluto and it's going to share it. But there's this stamp from, <laughs> probably most of you were, many of you were not born when these stamps came out. They had a nice series of stamps of planets and then Pluto's had not been explored. Uh, there's now a spacecraft, New Horizons, it's on its way to Pluto and it'll get there in four or five years and we'll get our first images of, uh, of Pluto. And of course we now know Pluto is, is part of a whole family of objects all about the same size. The orbit far beyond the sun is what we call the Kuiper Belt. And it's part of the reason that Pluto lost its, its planet status is it's really one of a whole class of objects. So here's the family, our own family, from Mercury and Venus, which I didn't say anything about, out through Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the question that everybody's always had is, you know, how many planets again back to the back to the pale back to the to the Earth is how common are these? This is what the Earth looks like in 238,000 miles. And now I've shown you what the Earth looks like from Mars, what it looks like from Saturn. And here's what the Earth looks like from beyond the orbit of Neptune. <laughs> the Voyager spacecraft, in one of its final pictures it ever took, it turned its camera back at the sun and took, a, took an image of the planets. And what you're seeing is scattered light from the sun. because you're From the point of view of being 4 billion miles away, this Earth's very close to the close to the sun. So it's hard to get the camera just right. And so you're getting some it's kind of a sunbeam, but here's uh, here's the earth. Now we live in a galaxy that has two hundred million stars. And so obviously the question you might ask, as Albertus Magnus did in the twelve hundreds, do there exist many worlds, or is there but a single world? This is one of the most noble and exalted questions in the study of nature. This is a really good quote if you want to get money to look for other planets, right? <laughs> this is the most important thing you can do. And interestingly enough, somebody had the right answer in the late 1500s. There are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. We see only the suns, in other words, all these stars. We see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous. Stars are glowing. But their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. And this turns out, we don't know about the inhabited part yet, but this is exactly the right explanation. We can't, it's very, very hard to see planets from other stars because they're so bright and the glare from them overwhelms the tiny amount of light you might get from their neighboring planet. So Giardo uh, Bruno had the right answer, explained it correctly, and he was burned at the stake in 1600. <laughs> for evoking views like this. So we think, for a long time, there's been theories for where do planets come from, how do we make planets. And we start, here's the galaxy, and you have clouds of gas that collapse, and they form smaller bodies. We've got the little balls of dust stick together. If you look under my bed, you see lots of dust bunnies, because the dust sticks together, and it grows bigger and bigger, and eventually you make planets. But this is a picture, this is a 20-year-old diagram. But the question is, is this right? And it's only then, in the last 15 years or so, that we can finally start answering this question of, are there planets around other stars? And the whole topic of how do we find planets around other stars is a very deep one. There's many ways that you can do it. And I don't, I don't want to go through all of them. The very first one was found by these two guys who looked at, the at a star, and then with the planets going around it, the gravity of the planet causes a star to wobble back and forth just a little bit. And that back and forth wobbling gives you a Doppler shift um, that allows you to uh, uh, infer the presence of a planet, even though you never see the planet. It's just like in a policeman with a radar on the way up here, I must have gotten zapped three times. 
looking to see, bounce something off of you, and then looking at the, the change in wavelength of the radar as it comes back. So today, we know there's 548 planets. And I looked this morning. This number is changing every day. But as of you know, 8 o'clock this morning, uh, we know 548 planets from other stars. Most of them, the ones that we know about, <coughs> are gas giants, like Jupiter. Some are ice, what we call ice giants, like Uranus and Neptune. Some are getting down into the realm of, of Earth's. But what we really want to know, to kind of get an idea of how common our own world is, is how many planets are in what some people call the Goldilocks zone, or the right zone where you can have liquid water on a planet. Going back to your question, you know, this prejudice of, well, you've got to have liquid water. So it's called the habitable zone. Again, thinking habitable means water. If you're too close to the sun, the water boils away. If you're too far from the sun, the water freezes. But there's some just right temperature region where you could presumably have habitable planets. But how, how, how common are those? And so one way you can try to, to, to get at this question is look for what are called transits. This is a transit of Venus. We are seen from the Earth. Venus passed, because everything was lined up just right. Venus passed between us and the Sun. And so you could see Venus. But you can imagine looking at lots and lots of stars from a great distance. Every once in a while, you'll get lucky. And the planet will be lined up between you and the star. And if you wait long enough and are patient, you'll see a drop of light. This is the amount of light you get from the star. You can see this nice dip in the amount of light caused by the planet going across the star. How would you tell the difference between a planet passing in front of a star and a sunspot? And a sunspot, and there's or uh, or there's lots of other false what are called false positives. And the devil's in the detail. I can talk about that later. It's it's tough, but you can you can figure it out. So this is what Jupiter would look like passing in front of the sun. This is what Earth and Venus would look like passing in front of the sun. And so there's this mission flying right now, called Kepler, and it's staring about 3,000 light years out, looking at hundreds of thousands of stars simultaneously in the Milky Way. And the idea is we're going to look at a lot of stars, and we're going to look for regular dips caused by planets passing in front of them. Now, just by chance, most planets, I mean, the odds are most planets are, if they're all, if, let's say every star has a planet, a lot of the, most of the time, planets are going around like this, and we're never going to see it because it doesn't pass in front of the star. But a, one, about a percent of the time or so, it'll be lined up just by chance to go in front of our line of sight. And so we can see how common Earths are in the galaxy. And so it's sort of the world's biggest digital camera. And these are all CCD images of. Um, uh, t uh, of, it's in, that Kepler is taking, and you can see all the stars. And you can, and the projector doesn't begin to show you all the stars it's taking, but it's monitoring all these stars for these regular dips in light. And Kepler is finding, it's being run by, by NASA Ames, and it's finding planets. It's just recently found a, pla a system that has six planets all lined up uh, 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 transiting the primary star. And so to find out if there's planets in that habitable zone, um, and again, for stars, stars that are hotter than the sun, that habitable zone's farther out. And for sun-like stars, say it's here. And for cool stars, you have to be closer. You have to huddle around closer. But what we're finding, what Kepler's finding, is there's lots of Jupiters. They found, Kepler's found lots of Jupiters. It's found even more Neptunes. So far, 662. And then small, rocky planets like the Earth, it looks a little bit disappointing. It's dropped down only 288. And this is uh, planets that are, say, twice as big as the Earth or so, and then actual Earth-sized planets, only about 68. But the mission is still in its infancy. It's only about the first year. And to be able to see rocky planets, you want to see them multiple times going around, so you're really sure what you're looking at. And if you have a sun-like star and the Earth, to be in that habitable zone, it takes a year. You have to wait a year to go around once, and then you don't believe the data, so you've got to wait another year 
you see it twice, and you want to be really sure because you're talking about an Earth, so maybe three times. So Kepler, these are really incomplete numbers. And if you do the math and estimate how common are rocky worlds like the Earth, and here's something just drawn a curve, I'm just showing you. But see how this curve goes up and up and up as you go to smaller sizes. These are small planets and big planets. And so while we don't know for sure, and this is just an extrapolation of what we've seen so far, it's sure looking like that there's lots and lots and lots of Earths. And it's too early to say how many are inhabitable zones, how many Earth-like planets there might be, but it's certainly encouraging that it seems like there may be lots of, lots of Earths out there. Yeah. So uh, what's the eventual goal? Is to find another planet maybe to go to? Or uh, is, which one is the one? It's just the, the, the goal is just to answer the question, ultimately you want to know, are there other inhabited worlds? What Kepler is doing, it's telling us how common do you get an Earth mass planet the same distance from a sun-like star as our, as our Earth. So what some people call a true Earth twin. So a one Earth mass planet orbiting a star where you could have liquid water. The Kepler planets are so far away that we'll never know if those particular planets they could be totally barren. They could have advanced civilizations on it. There's no way you'll ever be able to know from Kepler. But it gives you sort of a, you know, it answers the question, do we live in a Star Trek world where there's, every star has planets, we can go visit them? Or do we live in a very barren galaxy? That's what Kepler's answering. If you want to know the question, are these worlds inhabited, that's going to take another six or seven billion dollars to, that's all. That's all. To, mm -hmm. to, to fly a telescope that could do something like this, put its thumb up, block out the light from other stars so they can see the Earth and measure their composition, just like we do for Jupiter to find out there's ammonia in the atmosphere of Jupiter. We could ultimately, and these are just artist conceptions, I've been on, spent too much time on too many committees talking about non-existent spacecraft. But in principle, we have the technology with enough time and effort and money to go look at nearby Earths, to nearby stars, take spectra of their atmospheres, and you could perhaps see, are, is there things that don't seem to go together, like methane and oxygen? In our own atmosphere, we have oxygen and methane at the same time. The oxygen should destroy the methane. In, a, in like 30 years, all the methane should be gone from the Earth's atmosphere. But it's not. Why is that? It's being constantly It's constantly produced by life. So that's the kind of thing you want to go look for to figure out is there life on these other worlds. So that's, you know, I used to think maybe before I retired, I could possibly be involved in this mission. Now I think I'll be reading about it when I'm retired. But uh, we understand how to go about doing it, and eventually people maybe will hopefully find and figure out cheaper ways to do it and more efficient ways to do it that aren't, that aren't so, so incredibly expensive. Are there any missions currently in the planning stages that would do that? Or? No, just in the think about stages. So I'll leave you, this is, a, I leave this image, one like it, is, is also in the exhibition. Uh, quote, Epicurus from 300 BC, there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. We must believe that in all worlds there are living creatures and planets and other things we see in this world, which we still don't know the answer to, but we're working on it. So thank you. Questions or yes, okay. So, can you uh, describe the Ames uh, labs or where you work? And what are what are what are, what are all you guys doing? What is Ames about different say from the JPL or the right? So, um, Ames, that's the Ames. If you don't know where we are, we're in Mountain View, kind of the southern tip of the bay. Uh, and we um, Ames was founded originally to do aeronautics research. And there's lots of wind tunnels that are slowly being taken apart and scrapped because now instead of testing airplane designs in a wind tunnel, you test them in a computer. Um, but for complicated historical reasons, NASA wanted uh, its own set of scientists, uh, space scientists, and so there's a building, uh, a set of scientists that do space science, and I'm one of them, and aims just to fly missions just like JPL flies missions. And then eventually all the mission flying got moved pretty much to uh, JPL. So JPL is actually run, it's owned by Caltech, and it's sort of contracted to by NASA. So it's not technically 
uh, a NASA center in the same way that Ames or Johnson or Kennedy or Glenn Research Centers are NASA centers. Um, so Ames tends to be scientists, whether we're studying air traffic control or human biology in space or space science like me or um, uh, various aeronautics issues, reentry. Uh, Ames was for, um, uh, started out doing for uh, uh, reentry problems like the Apollo heat shield, what she made of those kind of things. Yes? So now that the uh, shuttle missions are coming to a close, mm -hmm. and, you, and, and it seems to be shifting over to uh, robotic flights instead of manned flights, are you, are you seeing any increase in uh, of your budget, or is that nothing? It's just all going. <laughs> it's. I mean. I mean, the space shuttle is, you know, is due, it's, it's ready. You know, its current mission is being delayed weeks after weeks because of an old-fashioned fuse box that's failed in the tail. And, um, uh, so it's time to change. The problem is that the, the switch to something new has not been handled maybe as well as it, as it might be in the whole, all the budget issues. So in terms, the, the, the sort of the science side, which is the hat that I sit on, has seen fairly, you know, reasonable and steady amount of, of funding. Um, so we're not as influenced as much by all the issues on the human space side. We don't go up when the other side goes down, and vice versa. So, you know, our budget hasn't really changed that much so far. So we're we're doing okay, but not. You, know, you can always think of more things you'd like to do, like, you know, fly the next space telescope and so on. But those are expensive. And can I follow up with that? Is, uh, you don't have anything to do with Hubble, I understand. Right, so I have... But is, is the next Hubble ready to go out? Yeah, so <laughs> the Hubble is also nearing its end of lifetime. And the replacement is called James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. And it's a six meter huge telescope that's going to unfold in space. It's going to be an L2 in this space in between the moon and Earth. And this huge sunshade and all these things are going to deploy. And it's also, people tell me the real issue was they were sold it at too low of a cost. The real cost hasn't really changed that much, but the, you know, there's, they the switch from the, you know, sell, the, the sales price to what the actual price was, it's been kind of <laughs> jarring. And so, and there's, it's not clear they're actually going to fly it still. They're still putting the money, there's, but they've got like $4 billion more to go. So it's scary, you know, given the whole climate, it's scary. And so, um, but, so hopefully it will fly and, and be good. And it's going to have a 10-year lifetime. And it will do lots of great stuff with exoplanets and, and uh, origin of the universe and so on. Could you explain the term exoplanet? So what do you call planets around other stars? And just, it's, I don't know, the, the buzzword that seems to have survived the Select, Darwinian selection has been exoplanet, just for like extrasolar planet. So exo for beyond, beyond. This doesn't entirely make sense, exo beyond, but that's what people call them, is exoplanets. Yeah. When we sent uh, the, whatever it was, I don't remember the name, but when we crashed into Jupiter, its power supply was a nuclear thing, am I not correct? And you said we weren't going to pollute the, the <laughs> and yet we said this nuclear power plant. Right. So, <laughs> so is, is there any, been any more follow up to the flap on that, or we well, away with one and we're going to do it the, again? The 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 only way you can really get beyond Jupiter is with nuclear power sources, and in fact, uh, with all the budget issues, the. Uh, they use plutonium, they have a supply of plutonium. It's not the same kind of plutonium you make a bomb with. This plutonium is radioactive, and as it decays, it gives off heat, and they basically have a thermocouple that turns the heat into electricity, and that's how you get electricity in the outer solar system. The Department of, uh, Department of Energy, there used to be what, I, what they say is uh, other, I can't remember the, the, the uh, way I say it, it's like other federal customers used to also use this power source for other things. But apparently the other federal customers don't need it anymore. So the only people that need it is NASA. And 
the stand, this is like a $20 million thing. It's very cheap by the scale of these things. But the, the, the A's don't understand it. And so they've actually turned off the supply of plutonium. So beyond this, Mars rover is going to use a lot of plutonium. And then after that, there's actually no more supply. So we can't even go to the outer solar system. And we're, uh, as a federal employee, I can't lobby the government. But the, the my society, the scientific societies, are really pushing to get them to turn back on the supply chain to make the plutonium. But from the point of view of Jupiter's mass, the plutonium on the spacecraft is minuscule. Yeah, sure. yeah, and, and that's why you drop it into Jupiter. You don't drop it into Europa, where there, maybe there's life under the ice or something. So that's a safe way to get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, does, does the spacecraft also rely on plutonium for propulsion, or is that using a separate fuel? No. So the propulsion is all like, uh, is like uh, uh, hydrazine and uh, chemical gases that react. There are ways you could do, like in 2001, like this, you know, ion engines and stuff, where you could use electricity. Ion and Yeah, you, exactly. And so there's more clever things you could do, but again, it just all takes money, and a lot of times the cheapest thing is to use the thing that's always worked, and you know how to build. Tried and true. And it's tried and true, as opposed to building something totally new. Well, again, thank you all for coming. It was great. If you have any more questions, I want to raise